this is Dr. Gus Stern, and I'd like to go over a technique I call double iris sutured IOL. Uh, basically, the procedure starts out uh, just as a regular iris sutured IOL, uh, but I actually double suture the haptics uh, to the iris so that there's less phacodinesis within the eye, and I feel that this provides uh, the lens with superior stability and uh, less of a chance of lens dislocation. Uh, this particular patient here had a cataract surgery um, about a decade ago and the lens uh, was uh, displaced infra uh, nasally so um, I've prolapsed the optic into the anterior chamber and here I'm using a mechanical suture to make the first pass uh, underneath of the uh, haptic of the IOL. You can see I have my second instrument underneath of the optic and I lift up on the optic and tint uh, the iris over the haptic uh, so that I like to get as minimal uh, a bite of the iris as possible. I um, try as much as I can uh, to put the sutures at the 3 and 9 o'clock positions and um, I'll kind of go over this a little bit later. I, I find that this uh, provides the best uh, cosmetic result and less uh, torsion of the lens. Uh, here is uh, again uh, just the first pass um, using a mechanical suture, uh, which is uh, in this case I use a 10 0 proline. I know a lot of people use a 9 0 proline, and, um, but since I'm doing a double stitching and I use a, a 10 0 proline. Uh, here is uh, getting the second end of the uh, proline suture through uh, the Mecca Faco wound there so that I can remove the viscoelastic with INA at the end of the case. I clip, um, this is a double armed mechanical suture and I just use uh, one suture so I kind of um, measure out the length of the uh, sutures so that I don't have to use two sutures because uh, these sutures are uh, kind of expensive. But here I've uh, clipped um, the suture uh, at about that midway point so that I can use uh, both ends of the suture again in the future. And we do a standard 3-1-1 uh, knot. And one thing uh, that I uh, like to do is actually uh, fasten down uh, the knot inside of the eye uh, and this um, really makes the um, connection between uh, the suture and the haptic and the iris as tight as possible so that there's uh, minimal uh, movement of the lens uh, once the final um, once the final result is achieved uh, so again you'll uh, see that um, I kind of tighten it up as much as I can outside of the eye and uh, what that allows you to do is to make a minimal movement inside of the eye. Uh, but you'll see, so I'll tighten it down as much as I can, grab it as close to the inside of the eye as I can, and I, I advance uh, the McPherson's here. And it's actually kind of resting right on top of the optic there, just very lightly, and then I pull it as uh, tight as uh, possible there. Uh, it's a similar concept of a mechanical or a a, um, a sleep or slip knot, uh, but I don't like the sleep or slip knot because I find that uh, sometimes the um, knot is not as uh, tight, or that uh, it's potentially not a locking um, knot. And uh, so, if I do a standard uh, three one one uh, with uh, pulling it tight inside of the eye. I'm positive that's going to be a locking um, knot. And here I just um, I pull the suture tight so that when I clip it outside of the eye, it kind of springs back in the eye and uh, it does have a little tiny tail, but it's nowhere near the endothelium. I'd also like to point out that I try to uh, make the suture passes uh, through a paracentesis. I used to go through straight through the cornea, uh, but I found that this is actually uh, kind of quite traumatic uh, to the endothelium that you have a lot more uh, corneal swelling uh, the next day if you just pass it straight through the cornea because a lot of times uh, the iris is very soft when you're working on it.
and um, you might be able to get a couple of passes where the eye has uh, still has rigidity and there's minimal corneal disruption but as uh, the case goes on the eye becomes soft and as you pass it through uh, the cornea you can get a lot of um, deformation of the cornea and uh, result in corneal edema the next day again this is um, uh, the technique that's very common is uh, passing it into a viscoelastic uh, cannula. I believe that's a 27 or 23 gauge viscoelastic cannula. That just makes it pretty easy to get the uh, suture uh, through that paracentesis without disrupting the cornea. And you're just uh, retrieving uh, the ends of the suture. And going to obviously uh, clip the uh, ends of the sutures again, uh, fold them through, and make uh, three one one knots with um, securing the ends of the knots through, uh, or actually inside of the eye, uh, so that again it's as tight, the knot is as tight uh, to the iris haptic uh, complex as possible. And um, I find that it, it's a little bit more difficult to uh, secure the knot in the, um, through the nasal uh, paracentesis, uh, but once you get the hang of it, it's, um, it's not too difficult uh, to do. It's basically uh, the same uh, process here of the 311 uh, suture and um, just pulling it as tight as you can, uh, grabbing it as close to the wound and inserting uh, the McPherson's inside of the eye. Uh, with him being uh, right on top of the optic and um, there's actually quite a fair amount of distance between uh, the McPherson's and the endothelium um, so as long as you do it carefully it's not really uh, close to the endothelium at all and again I just kind of uh, stretch uh, the iris up here and uh, it so that it retracts back into the eye. And now I'm on to uh, the second pass of the uh, proline suture uh, through the iris and underneath the haptic. Again, uh, tint the uh, iris up by uh, lifting up the optic with my second instrument. And so that I'm taking as small a bite of the iris as possible, and I, I feel like this uh, provides a better uh, cosmetic result. You don't have as much bunching of the pupil or possible iridodialysis if you take too big of a bite. And again, um, passing it through inside of the viscoelastic cannula, and then I kind of wedge it in there, and, and it kind of pulls out uh, pretty easily uh, there and there's very minimal distortion of the cornea uh, as you do this process. And as I mentioned uh, before, I like to try and make um, the bites to the iris uh, on a um, at around 3 and 9 o'clock. I find that it's very important to make uh, whatever, wherever you take the bites, it's very important that the bites are radial to each other. Uh, meaning that you know if your bite's at three, uh, your second bite should be at nine. Uh, if your uh, bite is at two, then it should be at uh, uh, ten o'clock. And uh, this is very important because um, you'll often be tempted if your first bite um, goes through, um, say for instance at three o'clock, and um, what happens is that the iris and um, optic can kind of uh, rotate inside of the eye, so you'd be um, tempted to um, take your second bite at a different location. And um, it's very important to actually 
um, kind of ignore ignore that uh, and either readjust the lens at that point or actually you can just readjust it um, after you uh, make your pass but before uh, you tie the knot um, you can readjust the um, optic lens complex um, so that you're taking kind of an equidistant bite um, of the um, haptic. Um, so again, if you if you were to take a bite at three, three o'clock and ten o'clock, for instance, um, then um, that lens is never going to really uh, sit properly inside of the eye, and um, this could lead to kind of a tilting of the lens, uh, an iris chafe. Um, so again, here uh, you see in the uh, video, this is the um, second pass um, through uh, the iris. So doubly securing down the um, haptic to uh, the iris. Again, I make my uh, locking knots inside of the eye uh, so that uh, the knot is very tight and the lens is much less likely to twist inside of the eye. And again, you'll see uh, I'm kind of uh, pulling that um, complex out of the eye. And, and when I sniff the suture, it does retract inside of the eye. And I have a post-op one day photo showing that the tails are, they kind of lie um, nicely flat against the iris. And I think the first pass that I um, showed, um, I did not lock um, the um, knot inside of the eye. But on this uh, second pass, I will um, lock the knot inside of the eye. And uh, again, here you'll see my second instrument is kind of tinting up the uh, iris so that I can get as minimal a bite um, through that iris um, as, as I possibly can. Again, I pass the uh, suture into the viscoelastic cannula and pull it outside of the eye. And then I uh, retrieve um, the cut haptics uh, with the Kuglin hook uh, through the uh, paracentesis. In this case, um, I believe it's uh, at uh, 3 o'clock or nasally in this uh, particular case. And um, if this were a right eye and you're a right handed a surgeon, uh, then I find that uh, for me uh, personally it's much easier to um, lock the knot inside of the eye with my right hand um, going inside of the eye. Um, it's pretty difficult for me to kind of do it the, uh, with my left hand inside of the eye. And um, you'll see uh, in the uh, video that uh, um, after I had placed the first uh, two sutures, the lens was pretty pretty well um, secured to the iris. It felt pretty stable inside of the eye. But when you put the second um, set of knots in, uh, it does feel much more um, secure inside of the eye. When I remove the viscoelastic, the lens is very, very stable. The anterior chamber is very stable. And um, here in this particular knot, uh, I have my McPherson's in my uh, right hand. Well, now I have them in both hands, but uh, the McPherson on the right here uh, will go inside of the eye. Again, it's the same process. Um, just uh, carefully insert the McPherson's inside of the eye. And um, use the optic uh, inside of the eye as a landmark. I'll just stay on top of that. And I'm uh, mainly pulling um, the um, knot on the with my left hand to kind of pull it tight. I do provide some tension within the eye, but not being too aggressive, obviously, inside of the eye, but just enough to uh, give it a good tension, and then my left hand will pull the knot tight and lock the knot. And these are, um, like I said before, they're square knots, they're not slip knots, so you can be, secu you can be um, feel secure that the knot is gonna be secure inside of the eye, it's not going to slip or uh, loosen up um, when you have a loose, obviously if you have a loose knot, um, lens is uh, subject to 
movement, slight movements to the side of the eye, which over repeated periods of time as a patient looks side to side throughout their lifetime can slowly loosen the complex and potentially cause the lens to uh, displace again. And in, in this particular case, um, um, the patient did wind up with a slight kind of um, oval uh, pupil or cat cat like um, pupil. Uh, it's, and um, you know, in that particular case, uh, it's most likely secondary to having a knot too close to the pupillary margin. Um, so I could have placed the knots just a slightly more um, laterally, especially on the temporal knot, but still gets a very good cosmetic result, and um, it's uh, not not that noticeable. Here you can see um, the patient has a good submarine's ring there and a pacified um, capsule, and um, just uh, kind of lightly irrigating. I did give this patient Diamox after the surgery. Um, because there's always a little bit of retained viscoelastic inside of the eye at the end of the case, and just want to make sure that the patient doesn't have a pressure spike overnight, which she did not. And here's the uh, conclusion of the case. On um, post-op day one, she uh, had uncorrected visual acuity of 20-30. She can see that she does have a little bit of an avoid pupil. And um, here are the uh, tails of the knots, um, very minimally above the iris. Thank you.